Tech Reimagined. Redefining the relationship between people and technology. Brought to you by Endava. This is Tech Reimagined. Welcome back to the Tech Reimagined podcast on cloud with James Rosenthal from Google Cloud and Razu Van Velia from Endava. In this half, we'll get to know each of our guests a little better and look back over their careers to understand how they got to where they are today. Let's start with James. Can you describe a little bit about your background? Sure. Thanks, Bradley. Um, Like many kids of the 80s and 90s, I was told the most important thing was to sort of find a profession. Um, And so I decided that since I wasn't brilliant at maths and I wasn't really into medicine, I would end up being a lawyer. And it kind of seemed fun from watching L.A. Law and reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, So that's what I did. I did law at university. I went to Sussex and then I went to College of Law, uh, did a legal practice course and started working for um, a relatively small niche intellectual property uh, law firm called Reuter Zucker. And fairly quickly, I realized that my, uh, I don't know, my thoughts of what being a lawyer would be were not actually the reality and it ended up, you know, not, not, not badly, but not, not right for me, like being just lots of contracts um, and that kind of stuff. And I think I realized that probably I needed to do something else to remain interested. And I, I kind of recognized that if you're interested and excited about what you're doing, you'll tend to be reasonably good at it. Um, so I figured I need to find something that, that engaged me more. And at that point, I, having done my two years training contract or articles, as it was called, And then two further years, so after four years, I decided that rather than entirely jettisoning what I knew about law, I would try and find a job that would be, that would put me as an in-house lawyer where I'd be able to get more experience in business and then have a better idea of what I wanted to do. Um, And I was fortunate that one of my clients at the time was a startup that specialized in smart card uh, technology and they were looking for an in-house lawyer. So I joined them and was able to sort of cover most of the legal stuff, maybe two, one, two days a week, and then get more involved in business development. That was a lot of fun. We ended up coming up with a product that was pretty cool, which was stadium access, um, particularly for football stadiums. So we worked with Arsenal, West Ham, Liverpool, Man City, and went pretty well. Uh, Figured I I kind of learned a lot, sort of adapted, recognized that, you know, had other skills over and above being a lawyer. Um, And then after a few years, I was approached by Google to come aboard um, to launch um, Google um, Checkout, which was like a PayPal competitor. And I've been there for 13 years. I think looking back at, you know, when I applied to Google, I really felt entirely uh, unqualified to do it. I felt massive imposter syndrome, as I suspect many or most people do. I just, you know, the people that I was going up against for the role had MBAs from Harvard or whatever it might be incredible experience and I didn't and so I think it's important that you know during this process one believes in oneself um, and recognizes the things that one's good at and emphasizes those and in the 13 years that I've been at Google I have worked initially on the on the checkout side and then working with global ad agencies in particular WPP uh, who are my client for a long time and have worked in the travel sector I have worked on Google social efforts um, and now I am working on the cloud side and I love it. I'm very fortunate to work for a company that allows you to sort of move around um, and get experience all over the place and continue to develop. So that's why I've been there for so long. And do you still use some of the techniques and learnings from your legal training? Um, I think I've had to retrain my mind because as a lawyer, I, um, for those lawyers listening or for anyone you know who's had legal background, I think you're predominantly told to like think about risk and how you mitigate risk and protect your client from risk and the reality is that when you're working in a business there is everything every decision has a risk an upside and a downside and you just have to become okay with that so i think it it taught me that you know risk is fine as long as you manage it okay and not to be so afraid of it as i would be not afraid but like sort of wary of it on a client's behalf for fear of getting sued um and i think it's some of the editing, you know, word, like editing text that one picks up as a lawyer and whether it's being able to read through a contract or um, just draft stuff in a succinct and understandable way is very useful. Like I'm still got my red pen. Well, the suggestions uh, <laughs> in docs or in words and go through documents and cut out words, which is probably the, the most useful thing I got. 
thanks for sharing that with us, James. And Radu, how about your career? I was born and grew up in in the middle of Transylvania, Romania, in a city called Cluj, Cluj Napoca. And during the high school period, uh, I started to think about what I would enjoy to do. One of the things that I really uh, like, and I still like, is uh, history because giving you the ability uh, to connect the dot, like in a puzzle. But also, I really loved the tech, technology, so I decided to study computer uh, computer science. During the first year of the university, it was pretty pretty amazing, and I had a lot of fun. After the first year of university, I decided that I should also uh, work. So I started to be a teacher uh, for a student from uh, high school for math and also computer science. And, af- and after that, it, it is pretty interesting that I started to work in Photoshop for around one year as a, de- as a designer for a US-based company. And during the summer, I decided to quit and to go and to do an internship that was more focused on the development side. And during that time, I started to be closer and closer to the development and to the thing that I'm doing uh, now. Also, uh, after I finished the university, I felt that uh, I didn't found enough information and the activity that I seen in the city during that times. From uh, the community point of view, it was not enough. So I started to be more and more involved in the community activities from the IT point of view. And I think that uh, that has the biggest impact on me because it forced me to speak in different environments with different people in the room. And I'm still doing this, uh, ensuring that uh, I'm giving back to the community, to the IT community, the lesson learned and the experience that I, that, I, that I gained in the last years. And James, have you had any mentors along the way or any outstanding pieces of advice you'd like to share? Yeah. Um, I'm fortunate to have lots of uh, lots of mentors. And I think the the most important thing that sort of helped me find mentors and what have you is recognise that actually asking for help is a strength as opposed to a weakness. I think we're sort of, or certainly when I was growing up and coming into the workplace, this idea of asking for help was seen as a weakness. You know, and you should be able to sort of just grit your teeth and get on with everything and solve it yourself. And I think what I've learned over the last 10 or so years is how important it is to have mentors, to have people who you can just go to and ask, like, what would you do in this situation? How would you think about it? What am I missing? Um, so I use, a, I'm very, again, I'm very lucky to have a bunch of people both at the office, you know, Google, and other people who I just sort of speak to generally, where I bounce, um, you know, bounce questions off of, bounce ideas off of. I, you know, it, it is impossible uh, for any of us to be able to, um, you know, process all of the information that's coming at us at any time and to be able to then, on the basis of that, make good career decisions or make good life decisions. So I, I think the idea of having um, mentors is, is critical. And for, for those of you listening who, you know, you're not sure, well, who do I ask or I'm embarrassed to ask, most people, in, in my experience, are happy to help. Like, as Radu said, you know, he, you know he's doing his work, uh, you know, where he's offering uh, his advice, his guidance, his mentorship, back to his his community, the IT community locally, uh, you know, and I do the same when people ask if I've got time just to sort of run through things with them. It's my pleasure. So I think don't be afraid to ask people uh, whom you know or whom you can get connected to for half an hour of their time once a month. I think it, as a mentee, it's important, you know, if you're being mentored to have specific questions you want, you want answered or things to work through, like to be coached through. If you just kind of think about mentorship as sort of turning up once a month and saying, hey, well, you know, these are all the different things that are on my mind. I think it's a bit weak. I think you owe it to your mentor to come with specific challenges and the suggestions or the solutions you've already thought of. Um, Okay, I think that makes the sessions um, much more useful. I also think it's important to, if possible, get mentors who have, who are unconnected with your work at present insofar as there's no conflict of interest. I don't mean like from a legal point of view, I just mean generally that it doesn't matter to them which course you take. 
in terms of it won't enrich or 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 um, you know harm them, regardless of what decision you make, because then you're going to be almost guaranteed you're going to get good advice. Bradley, in terms of um, you know the piece of advice that I was given, um, wasn't specifically given to me. It was um, Google CFO Ruth Porat, who's absolutely amazing uh, business person. She came from Morgan Stanley, where she was CFO during the credit crunch, and she talked about her career and how she made choices and what have you. And she gave the example of, you know, always going to her managers, her leaders and, and asking for, you know, things where, where they think it would really stretch her. And so when, when I now look at opportunities, I think about, well, will this enlarge me? Will it, will it force me to learn new stuff and, and, and kind of, look, you know, develop? And on that basis, I try and take roles that will and avoid roles that won't. And I, I used to think, well, will this make me happy taking this role or doing this thing? And actually that's quite like I found to be quite an ephemeral thing. I think enlarging oneself is a better North Star than will it make me happy. So that's the advice I got for what it's worth. Oh, that's a fantastic piece of advice. And Ratu, how about yourself? I had a few of mentors uh, in the past and I still have. Um, I think one of the best buy that I received eight or ten years ago was talk less and listen more because many times when you already know what the customer or the other person that you're talking about is what is uh, or the other person that you are that you're talking with is trying to say you just want to give the response or to con- or to continue the, dis- the discussion so just uh, waiting for the for the other to finish also, will uh, give confident will give will will provide confidence to the other person, and, and another advice that I would uh, give to people from the mentoring point of view is try all the time to have, if you can, at least two different mentors. As James said, one that is not connected to your to your job. It, it might be from another company or from any other industry. And another and another one, uh, try to find somebody from the company that you work on or part of the organization that knows very well the organization and can provide you insights and provide you support in a way how you could approach different things inside the or or inside the organization, because each company is different and is working uh, in a different way. If I could just jump in there, I couldn't agree more with Radio. I think firstly. You know, it's beholden upon all of us to listen more than we speak, not least because we already know what we know and we don't know what other people know. So the more we listen, probably the, the, the better decisions or the better um, we can be of service to them. And, and that idea of having um, mentors both in, like in-house in your company where you work or in the organization you're with and outside, I think is really useful because it allows you just to get that balance. Um, and particularly that, you know, there are often things or aspirations Uh, one has that you might not want to share with people in your company because the fact is you might in a year's time want to go and build a startup or you might want to go and leave the country and work somewhere else and that those may not be things you'd you'd be comfortable sharing with someone within Endava or in my case Google but you would like to have someone who's able to give you you feedback on those points. Definitely one of the uh, most amazing relationships that I have is that I was a mentor for someone within Endava who um, who left our company and I've continued being the mentor with him external and it's amazing how it gives you much more of an objective approach um, and, and helps just completely free any constraints from any advice that anyone's giving. Completely agree. Um, do either of you read business books or listen to any podcasts I guess at this point, I should announce that this Tech Reimagined podcast is released every Thursday. But except for except for this podcast, uh, James, do you read any books or, or podcasts? I used to read a lot of business books. And I end up getting a bit frustrated with them. Not this is no reflection on, on the authors or anything. I think I just found that, you know, they generally tended to contain one or two like real nuggets. But then those nuggets were like stretched over 200 pages. And I just thought, oh, man, I'll just read like a synopsis online. So I probably cheat and just read like summaries of business books that I think are useful. The, the most, the thing that stuck with me most business book wise is the idea of servant leadership. And it's a book by um, Robert Greenleaf. And it, it just talks about the idea of a leader, um, you know, his or her responsibility is to be of service to the people around him or her. The idea of, of servant leadership and the leader, rather than being the person who's like, you know, 
doing everything from the front and dictating and being autocratic. It's more about how that person can be of service to the people around uh, herself or himself. And I would recommend, you know, folks looking into it because I think it's certainly for me, it's really changed the way I think about showing up at the office and seems to have aligned with, you know, projects going fairly well. And Radu, uh, any business books that you can recommend or podcasts? I used to read a lot of business books in the past, or let's say more technical books, until one year ago. And once my second child came, uh, the time started to be very, very limited. But one of the books that really helped me to understand why some companies are struggling to grow is No Man's Land. And I really recommend uh, uh, this uh, this book that is written by uh, Doug Tatum. Try to not watch the movie because it's a different story. It, it doesn't have any connection with the, uh, the book No Man's Land. So I really highly recommend for people to read this book if they are trying if they want to understand why a company that is around fifty to sixty people is struggling to grow and to reinvent themselves or for example the same thing is usually happening for a company that are around four or five hundred people so it is a book that changed the way how i see and i'm and i thinking about uh, business uh, growing especially from the organization point of view and james any key opportunities or standout moments that occurred in your career that you'd like to share uh, lots i think i've been unbelievably lucky um I was lucky that I had a friend at Google uh, who suggested, you know, the recruiter suggested they get in touch with me. I'm lucky, you know, that, to Radu's point, um, family and all of those kind of things, I think, have, have really worked out for me. And I didn't take any of those things for granted. In terms of opportunities, it, it goes back to that idea about taking decisions that enlarge you. Often, you know, things come, you know, land on your in your inbox or on your desk or someone has a word with you. And you think to yourself, eh, I don't know, imposter syndrome, am I actually able to do that? There's that way outside my comfort zone. Well, in my experience, do it. You know, it will, it will take you in all kinds of directions that you never, uh, you never expected. I mean, in my case, being on a, a podcast now talking about cloud computing, which I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't have expected like a year ago. But you know what I mean? Like, if you think it's going to give you the opportunity to, to grow, take it. And Radu? That's a very hard question. First one being the moment when I decided to quit from my designer job and decided to do a free month internship for an uh, IT company. The second one would be the moment in time, I think in 2012, when I became a Master Azure MVP because it opened a door and I understood better how a big organization works, especially from the way how features are planned, why some of them, even if for one customer, sounds very important. At the global level, they're not so important as you might think. And James, what do you think has changed between you starting your career and today's graduates coming into our profession? Well, this just makes me feel very old. Um, but like, I remember when I, when I started work, which was in like 96, 97, we didn't all have our own computers. <laughs> Uh, email was hardly a thing. I know I sound like a grandpa now. Uh, but I, I think what what has changed now is the level of informality, uh, it, which is a really positive thing. I don't mean in terms of like not having to wear a suit. I just mean that sense that good ideas can come from anywhere in a business. And particularly, you know, my experience at Google has been if you have a um, you know, good idea or a way of looking at things that's supported by data, you know, there's some evidence to what you're saying, there's a better than average chance that you'll be able to, you know, develop that idea. And I think that's really important and really empowering um, for graduates who come in now. I think it's increasingly difficult for graduates now, and, and this was before COVID, like to figure out, you know, which industries have, um, you know, best prospects, you know, areas where machine learning, areas where automation might come in and render them, you know, less preferable. So I think it's it's hard to know. And I think one thing that's helped me is like that the idea that, you know, zigzag careers, I guess as mine has been in some respects, is not a bad thing. Like I don't think there is that kind of very clear, well, I start a grad scheme at Unilever when I'm twenty three and that takes me through till I retire. I just don't think that seems to be the way things are going. So the idea that you can pick up skills as you go along. Uh, and that those make you 
better. You know, so the idea of becoming, I mean, unless there's a particular area where you want to be hyper-focused, the idea of becoming a generalist is probably useful. Um, and recognizing that the skills you pick up, where, where, you know, where they're able to be adapted and where they're going to put you in, in good stead. Um, and I also think not, like, not to expect or, you know, there is a, I think it's a misconception about millennials, you know, expecting everything to be handed to them on a plate. I know that's not the case, but I think that I did, one does have to work hard uh, and that, you know, you sh your first kind of one-to-ones when you get a new job shouldn't be about, well, how long will it take you to get promoted? It should really be about like where you can be of service and be useful and generate good outputs. Um, I have had experiences, you know, where I'm talking to new hires and the first thing they tell me is they, you know, they think they got hired at a, low, a lower level. They should be out and what they need to get promoted. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, like just think about where you need to be able to add value, prove yourself, demonstrate those things and everything else will fall into place. So be more focused on doing a good job uh, and sometimes less uh, impatient when it comes to like getting promoted. Really interesting there. And Razu, what's, what's it like from your perspective in Romania? Well, additional to what James said, I would say that one of the biggest different differences is one of the biggest differences is uh, the roles that are now more clear for the people. So I I remember twelve, fifteen years ago, uh, the job description that were available on the market was very very generic, and you would find only two or three different types. But now you have a lot of roles like automation, full stack developer, architect, cloud architect, uh, full stack, uh, full stack architect, and so on. So, starting from their university years, it is more easy for them to understand what is the market is looking for, uh, what might what might they enjoy more or uh, or less to be able to e to identify maybe some uh, area that they will like to develop for a few for a few years and also the uh, the material that are available on the market now nowadays you can find a lot of free materials available that can be used if you want to learn or if you want to decide to follow a, a, a specific path so Rado, that, that is really good. And actually it just chimes with one of the things we look for when we're hiring. And a lot of people ask me, you know, how'd you get a job at Google and what have you? I think that to the extent that regardless of at what point you're in in your career, the more that you can demonstrate that you've actually sort of taken risks in terms of leading things. So, you know, if you always say, oh, well, I've always wanted to write a book or I always wanted to publish a blog or do a vlog and if you've done it regardless of how successful it is it's much more impressive than folks who just sort of follow that kind of um pretty well laid path of hopefully going to a good school doing all right in their exams going to university then going to work for a consultancy or going to work for an accountant or going to work for lawyers and not really having to make any difficult decisions or take any risks along the path so i think we're really the fact is so much information is available on the web about everything uh, and if you do have passions or there are things you're into, I, I would recommend to the extent that you have the time and the, you know, the ability to pursue them, not so they become your day job, but so that you have something interesting to bring that's out of the ordinary and shows that, you know, you are able to be a self-starter um, and sort of build something out of nothing. And reg again, regardless of whether you do it with a group of people or by yourself, I just think it's really, it's really compelling. I'd always... Um, you know, go for someone who's got some of that kind of experience over someone who might have slightly better exam results than the person than that other person because I think they've demonstrated an ability to just do something, uh, which is unfortunately rare. I completely agree with you, James, and I think that this whole COVID period is going to be such a differentiator between people. I, I can imagine in a few years' time, one of the most popular interview questions is going to be like, "What was?" your career like? What did you do during COVID? And people want to hear the challenges you faced and then how you overcame them uh, right across the board rather than people who just coasted through this period. And finally, what, what's both of your daily routine look like? Any tips that you can share with us? 
James, you're still working from home all the time. And I think Google has announced that you're going to be working from home for the foreseeable future. So can you share anything with your teleroutine? At the moment, we um, are working on the premise that we will be working from home until July 2021. So yeah, I needed to think about like a work environment and how I get stuff done and how I get quiet, like Radu, um, you know, got kids, a dog, who you may have heard in the background. Um, I try still get up early. I mean, the, initially the temptation under COVID was just lay in bed. Uh, that's not good for me because I think I, I'm, I'm more of a morning person. So obviously recognizing when you're at your most productive. Um, and try, I, I, what I found is that I really miss those kind of chats that I would have in the office, you know, just walking to get a coffee or wandering around, you know, from desk to desk or whatever it might be. And so just trying to keep in touch with people who aren't in my direct team necessarily, but just pinging them once in a while so that those connections and relationships continue and just see how people are doing. I think that's really helped me because otherwise you feel a bit, uh, a bit at sea. Um, and yeah, I try and to the limited extent do exercise, which is just walking the dog. But otherwise I feel I'm very sedentary and I think there's a tendency just to be stuck at a desk all day long. Uh, whereas in the past you would have been like, I don't know, getting on the tube to meetings or traveling, flying places, whatever. So making sure that I'm not just stuck. And how do you block out some of your time? Because uh, I've tried doing something very similar where I try to go for some really short walks through the day just so that I can get out of my uh, home office. But how do you block that out during the day and make sure that no one will book meetings during those times? Um, we have, I guess, like, you, well, you probably use Outlook or you'll use Google Calendar. It's an excellent product. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I just put things in, like I put blocks in my calendar. My calendar's shared, so anyone can look at it in the company, and I just have blocks. And so I block time out, and if people try and overbook it, I'll decide whether I want to join them or not. I think there's no, there is a lot of power in saying no. If you always say yes to people, then people don't really appreciate uh, you're making an effort to, to help them with stuff, and they just assume you've got nothing better to do. And Ratu, what does your daily routine look like? Now, you are actually on holiday this week, so thank you very much for joining us. But usually, what does your daily routine look like? Uh, usually waking up at around 6, 6.30. I have the obsession to, to be in the front of the computer at 9 a.m. So this is something that I do day by day during the working days. 9 a.m., I open my laptop and check in my emails. Another routine is, that all the time I'm keeping my inbox clean. That I don't know if you really enjoy it, but I'm not a big fan of it. I usually try every two or three days to go running, and not in the morning as I used to do in the past, but in the middle of the day. So around uh, 1 or 2 p.m., I go for a short run of half an hour or one hour in the forest. Well, thank you both to James and Radu for spending some time with us to reimagine cloud technology. I hope you'll join us next time for another interesting discussion on the Tech Reimagined podcast. Please remember to like this podcast and hit the subscribe button.